started with our keynote luncheon. Uh, just a couple of things uh, for those in here and for those watching in Simplot. After uh, Dr. Martin speaks, we are all going to meet back in Simplot and then we will be released from there to the three breakouts. So after lunch, you're going to return to Simplot and then we will be released from there to the three breakouts. And you can choose two of the three. It will run 30 minutes. All right, now all that out of the way, uh, I have not prepared anything, but I do want to say a couple of special words about Dr. Sam Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin and I both started at the FCI, the Frank Church Institute in August. Uh, Dr. Martin coming from Dallas, uh, where she's been for the last few years teaching at Southern Methodist University. Her and her husband, Paco, and their two sons uh, moved here. And I think within like minutes, um, I, we had been introduced. And uh, we went on a road trip across this entire state together, uh, promoting the High School Model United Nations, which is also housed under the Frank Church Institute. Uh, and we have spent literally every second together uh, since then. And Paco, I know you can attest to that. Uh, so to <laughs> get my family. And I have nothing but amazing, remarkable things to say about Dr. Martin. She is kind, she is compassionate, she is real, and she is authentic. And she's exactly what the Frank Church Institute needs. She's exactly what the School of Public Service needs. And she's exactly what Boise needs. So can we give a warm welcome to Dr. Sam Martin. Thank you so much for that, Monica. Is, is it, it's hard to tell. Is it my, if you can hear me in the back, you can hear me just fine. Great. Um, no? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, let me see. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm going to be sorry when my welcome period is over and people are used to me because. Uh, never in my life have I heard so many people say so many nice things about me, and it, 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 I just love it. And I was thinking to myself when I was driving to campus this morning, when you do a PhD, every person I know who's ever done a PhD uh, goes through what you were, what's referred to, uh, I think it was St. Francis of the CC Center first, it's a long, dark night of the soul, writing um, a dissertation. And if you would have told me during my long, dark night of the soul, eventually I would be in this position, doing this job, uh, having these opportunities, I, I would have said you were crazy, right? I just, I had no idea the terrific life that I was going to be fortunate enough to lead. And so I just am so grateful and excited to be here and to be part of this university and to have this opportunity. So, um, you know, uh, I, uh, when uh, Dr. Marlene Trump first got hired to be president, um, I, was very excited that Boise State had hired a woman uh, as its first president. And so for no reason in particular, if you, if you did know me very well, you'd know this is not the kind of thing I do. Uh, my husband, Paco, who's sitting here not listening, but on his phone, like usual, <laughs> <laughs> he would tell you, he would tell you that this is the sort of thing that I don't do. I sent her uh, an email for, I sent her an un, what's the word, you know, a, an email out of the blue. And I wrote a lot of things, but at the end I said I woke up every day high-fiving myself uh, because we had this terrific female president. I feel like I wake up every day high-fiving myself that I uh, have this job. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I hope you're having a good day. I hope you're uh, enjoying uh, the many speakers. I will now try to live up uh, to the example that they have set. That they have set. Uh, and I, I hope you noticed that the, I titled what I was going to say today, Why We Should Talk about religion and politics. And talking is hard. Talking is hard. Uh, 
stepping up here now talking to you is hard because when we talk to each other, we risk conflict. And when we talk about things like religion and politics, we really risk conflict. And nobody likes conflict. Or at least most of us don't like conflict. And we heard a lot of people this morning on the panels, and certainly in Ms. Jankowitz's talk, point out how quickly conflict can get out of control and how quickly we can be misunderstood. Nobody, li nobody likes this except the people who are instigating it and seem to live off of it. And we don't want to be those people. It makes us really uncomfortable. And so we have the American saying, and I, I'm not sure if it's in other countries, I imagine it probably is, that if, you want to, if you're in polite company, you don't talk about religion and politics. And religion is like especially taboo, right? Except for those of us most prone to being evangelists, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses who knock on your door and you like, try to lay down so they can't see that you're home or the, the, the Mormon missionaries who, uh, you know, you, you try to avoid at all costs, right? Except for those of us especially prone to be an evangelist, which is actually a very small number of people, most of us feel like talking about our faith unprovoked is, is like being asked about our sex lives or being asked about our most intimate disease history. We don't want to talk about it. And we'll say that it's very private, okay? And if someone talks to us about it, we'll leave and we'll be like, oh my God, that was too much information. It was just way too much information. And these days when it comes to politics, we think we'll offend someone or we'll find out we have the wrong beliefs. And someone we thought we were gonna be friends with, now we can't be friends because we have the wrong beliefs. We're now labeled as extremists. We have been misinterpreted or misunderstood. And now we're going to be left out. But what I want to suggest to you today is when we don't talk, we lose a lot of texture in our relationships. Because the first thing I want to suggest to you and I want to ask you to hold is that we wouldn't be so upset if these things didn't matter, if they weren't really important to us. And so when we go around refusing to talk about it, we refuse to talk about things that are really important to us. And we refuse to reveal and be in relationship about things that are in some ways giving us life. That's why we care, right? And so I want to do something with you that I hope will drive this point home. And so to begin, and, and I'm going to have this up here, I just want to show you this picture that I hope I can bring up. This picture. This is a picture of my two sons. Uh, the one in red is named Niles, and the one in lavender is named Tate. And that is our house. That's actually my bedroom, my, my master bedroom, in our house in Dallas. That's an intimate space. And they are in an intimate space. Uh, you can see, if you look on the left, that's a, that's a towel hanging on the door to go into our master bedroom. And that was the desk that wasn't always in the bedroom. We had to put that in there because of the pandemic so that I could work out of my bedroom to teach my classes. And those are pictures uh, that uh, my sons drew for me and I wanted to save. Uh, on the left is Pat Mahomes, uh, who my son drew. Uh, it's an American flag by my son Tate uh, for me because I love to study politics. Um, the Martin Luther King, I very, very carefully uh, brought to Boise because, and it almost it brings tears to my eyes to think about it, because the, the writing says, we will be free when kids stop shooting each other, right? And he wrote that in first grade. And then emojis, right? And a heart. And they're jumping on the bed. And I had a photographer friend in Dallas, and I asked her to come over and take some pictures of us in our home. So it's a staged picture before we moved because that was our home. And we were coming to this wonderful life I started out telling you about, but that was their boyhood home and we had to leave it. That's where they were tiny and where they had a nanny 
and where they played with their magnet tiles and went to preschool. And right across the street, they went to kindergarten. And that house was our life. And we did the pandemic there. And when Dallas had a huge freeze a couple of years ago, you might have heard about because Texas won't join the grid. All four of us <laughs> slept in that bed, trying to stay warm. We watched a million shows on Netflix. That was our life. And that's our story. Now research tells me that as you look at that picture and you see that it's nice, but it also tells me that with the exception of my mom and dad who happen to be sitting here and maybe even them, at some point when I was talking, you thought about small children in your life or your grandchildren or your sons and daughters or your pandemic history or something about my life here that is your life. You saw my picture and it meant something to you because you don't know them. They're not your people. They're my people. And we call this process when we're academics, we call this emplotment. And emplotment is how we make meaning in life, right? You hear that word in the middle, plot. We write the plot for our life. And when we meet others, we draw our plots together. It's collective meaning making. Through emplotment, we tie events together. Events that actually have very little to do with one another or that are really just moments in time. They got yelled at a million times for jumping on the bed, but then they got to do it on purpose. This is not, right? <laughs> right? So think about the American proverb, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Actually, things happen for the reasons we decide. And the reasons we give, we say in narrative theory, the reasons are good reasons. Good reasons. Not good in the sense of righteous, but good in the sense that they make sense in the context of our lives, our individual lives. We can understand our successes and losses and disappointments and joys in reverse. Today's celebration gets added meaning because of the employment we get to draw a line through and also connect last year's wound, last year's disappointment, last year's failure and give it meaning. Oh, I got the job at Boise State. That's how come this thing didn't happen that I really wished for. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying that we tell a story to make things feel less random. A million other stories are usually possible because the story we tell ourselves demands a center of the universe kind of thinking. My story has to be center stage at all times. When I got this job, other people didn't. So they had to tell a story to themselves about why that happened. Okay, so good reasons. Good reasons meaning our personal explanations that allow us to understand our own lives, that are authentic and true to us. Well, if our reasons are authentic and true, and we want our stories to be respected, we have to acknowledge that other people have good reasons too. And just like you, other people understand their lives as stories that link together and make sense. And they even understand their politics as narratives. How often have you thought about your own political beliefs or heard someone else talk about theirs as being rooted in a story about their life? A person they knew, something that happened to their dad or their mom or their friend or even themselves. Of course we get information from the media and we blame the media, but if these ideas only came from the media, they probably wouldn't feel so personal. Or at least this is what I think. It's why I decided to pick narrative theory out of the grab bag of theories I was gonna study in, in graduate school. That's why I didn't wanna, you know, I wasn't that good at math, so I didn't wanna be a quantitative theorist anyway. <laughs> so think about that and think of how willing you are at least when you're in a safe environment, or you're sitting around a bottle of wine with your friends to share your stories. Now let's go back to where I started. Why should we talk about religion and politics? 
Well, here's the first thing. I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't just have an expertise in politics. I have an expertise in political language, right? I read things very closely and I listen to things as closely as I can. And so what I just say, why should we talk about religion and politics? Well, I posed a sort of question as an interrogative. We should talk about religion and politics. What didn't I say? I didn't say argue. I didn't say why, should we, why we should argue about religion and politics, right? When, I, when we say it, tell each other, don't talk about religion and politics, it's because we're afraid we're gonna argue, right? But what if we thought about politics as shared stories, collective meaning making, right? Go back to the picture of my son and think about what you thought of in reply, right? When you thought about my story and you thought about your story, did you wanna attack my story as stupid? Did you wanna attack my story as immoral? As based in bad reasons? Probably not. Even if you don't think kids should jump on the, bat, on the bed, you're not mad at me about my story, right? You might even think it's kind of cute, right? So I love narrative theory when it comes to politics because it takes how we live the rest of our lives and it applies it to something really contentious. And it says, there's something else happening. There's something beyond. There's a reason, there's a good reason. And a good reason doesn't have to be a reason you agree with. It's just, it, it allows people to actually have lived experiences and not just stupidity. I was thinking about this way back in 2008, way back in 2008, it's becoming a million years ago, when I was in graduate school and I was first setting out on my task to be an independent researcher. And so if you think about 2008, you can get all the way back there. There's two things happening that were huge. One was Barack Obama. And two was we were on the cusp of the largest economic catastrophe the nation and the world had faced since the Great Depression. And this was a really strange juxtaposition because the nation was awash in hope and possibility. And right after Obama got elected, serious rage in the form of the Tea Party. And these two things were extremely bifurcated. It was very strange as a person who thinks about politics. So I started to read the literature that had to do with that. And I noticed something kind of weird which was that the Tea Party was made up disproportionately of evangelical Christian believers. And as a researcher, this was strange because demographically, <coughs> evangelicals tend to be uh, a little bit below uh, average in median income. Not far always, but, but they're not a wealthy uh, subculture, typically. So it was strange that they reacted to the Great Recession in a way that is toward the Tea Party and not toward a more progressive form of, of, of economic populism. And so I was watching this and I'm trying to figure out how to research it. And this is also about four years after this uh, uh, popular intellectual, public intellectual named Thomas Frank had written this book called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it was, it asked such an interesting question, but it also gave for political scientists such a bad answer that four years later, people were still talking about. And so in What's the Matter with Kansas, Thomas Frank had written this book about his boyhood state of Kansas. Kansas I guess Kansas gets a lot of press because we we're talking about them with the, after the Dobbs ruling. But at this point, uh, the question that, that Frank posed was, why had Kansas, where he grew up, why had it switched from being a state that primarily elected Democrats from the state house all the way to their Washington rest? Why had it switched from being a state that elected Democrats to be in a state that elected Republicans. And Frank's answer was that as uh, the influence of evangelicalism in politics had grown in Kansas, people had switched and they had uh, begun to, to vote their values as the saying goes. So they had voted to elect people who would promise to uh, tighten abortion laws and uh, crack down on Hollywood and regulate Hollywood and um, do all the, do, like pass the social values agenda that, uh, uh, social values voters, as we tend to call them, would do it. And he said, this is a bad bargain because they elect people who promise this, but they don't fall through. They go to Washington. And what they do is they forget about those base voters and they pass all kinds of laws that help big business, that help the wealthy. And so 
is a bait and switch. I promise and I do. Right? And so essentially what Frank was saying is they don't know what's best for them. And they should try to change culture through their churches and they should vote for Democrats and have more money in their wallet. And this is an interesting question. Okay? Because before you get upset with me or think that my interest as a researcher was trying to figure out how to get more Democrats elected, that's not my interest. People should vote, vote however you want. It's your vote, right? But it's an interesting question. What changes people's political worldview? What changes people's political worldview? Why did the, what is happening to make that go on? And Frank took the point of view that Kansas voters, a majority of them, were conservative evangelicals, true, who are willing to pay higher taxes in exchange for, right? He was saying that, a part, that, that poor people were voting for a party that was against poor people. It's not a very great form. It's, not, it's, it's just not good, right? So the problem with that statement that he essentially was making it when you boil it all the way down is that he's an outsider. And he's projecting a story onto a group, assuming his priorities should be their priorities. His story should be their stories. And that he knew what was best for other people when he wouldn't like people doing that too. But as people, we do this all the time. We assume we know what other people value and what are the primary narratives they live by. We do it all the time. I mean, because I happen to study this subculture, people come to me all the time and they're like, oh good, you're the one who understands why uh, uh, Christians do this, that, or the other thing. And I'm like, why do you assume this, that, or the other thing about Christians? Right? And they're like, well, well, okay. What happens when we do this is we overlay our narratives of what something means. Our primary priorities of what something means. Our foremost stories of what something means. On someone else's narratives on someone else's primary priorities. And it kind of works in part because we do have stories in common. We know what it means to love your kids so much you want a picture of them before the moment's over. We do have stories in common. My favorite example is this and wherever Luke Wentz is, here we go. Uh, you may be familiar with the famous story of not Ronald Reagan, but the pilgrim John Winthrop who, before landing with his congregation on the shores of Boston Harbor, gave a sermon in which he said the settlement would be a city on the hill. Ronald Reagan didn't think Winthrop's words were good enough, so he had a shine. <laughs> he, added a he, he added a modifier. But, uh, and I love that Luke did that this morning because he's making my point for me. In fact, the story about the Winthrop sermon has become an American foundational narrative. It's part of our national myth, our origin story of how we became the United States of America. Many even understand it as the genesis of our idea of American exceptionalism. I wrote it in advance. <laughs> or at least our idea of why we think our think of ourselves as being exceptional in the United States. But guess what? For Winthrop, in his life and as his narrative, and to his congregants on the ship, it was not any of those things. I want you to really hear this. It was not any of those things. He was telling a story. Winthrop understood himself as what? An English colonist. He understood himself as a person who was English. And he was speaking to a bunch of other people who were English. And the shining city on the hill was to show the rest of the English people back across the ocean how to live properly as English people. How to, he had no conception, zip, of the fact that this was gonna become the United States of America and in 2022, Sam Martin and Luke Wentz were going to be all shining city on a hill. What does it mean? Zip. 
He didn't know about the horrors of slavery, the horrors of the reservations where we would uh, drive the indigenous people to live. He didn't know about uh, the glorious things that the American nation would do. He didn't know about the Bronco football and the blue turf. None of that <laughs> was part of his worldview. The city on the hill was meant to reflect back to England, to the English. But for us, that story that began in Boston Harbor is part of our American citizenship. It's part of who we think we are. What our nation is supposed to mean and what it's supposed to be. And the question is, what does it mean? How do we as different people who don't agree and who have different subcultures blend our stories together, our understanding of the shining city on the hill? Okay, so then what is the matter with Kansas? What is the matter with Idaho? What is the matter with California? Well, 2008, I'm looking in San Diego. There's foreclosure signs everywhere. There's hardship everywhere. There's also wealth everywhere. I wanna understand. I also, despite all the energy coming at you and the most introverted person you could know, I wanted to do an academic study and never have to leave my house and talk to another person. <laughs> so, I designed a study where I could go to church online and just be by myself, go out for runs, listening to these sermons, come home and write about it and have a dissertation in the end. So I did. I went to church over and over and over again because through churches, churches are where evangelicals go to tell each other stories, right? Pastors tell stories and then they repeat the stories to each other. I went to Bible studies online. Right? I did everything I could possibly do online, not in person. I don't want to be there in person. I want to be online. Right? To hear the stories. How did, how did Christians talk about the recession? How did Christians talk about the election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? What is happening? How do they understand politics? And how does it match what I'm seeing on TV? And how is it totally different? Right? Now, before I continue, let's qualify. I'm talking about people who self identify as white. Okay? They self-identify as white. A pollster asks them, how do you identify? They say they're white. And I'm talking about people who self-identify as evangelical. There could not be a more contested term in the American political landscape. Okay, so pollster says, are you evangelical? They say yes, they can't, right? Typically, we're talking about someone who would say that they're born again, and they believe that everyone needs to be born again to get to heaven. That's the most rough definition you can have. That's who I'm thinking about. It's a terrible it is, it is the, I, I just, I don't want to belabor the point because you don't want to be here all day, but that's what I'm talking about. You, I have a great book where I, def, where I define it much better in very academic terms. You, you can buy it. It's called Decoding the Digital Church. All right. But there are a lot of people who identify and they have an evangelical story in common, but not every story in common. But was there something in their political worldview that could help us? Was there a type? Stories that come together to create what the philosopher Blaise Pascal has called an esprit de finesse, a sense of things that resonates as true, a kind of gut knowledge, the things that are true because they've always been so, and they've always been so because they're true, right? It's helpful to think of stories as existing in an esprit de finesse because they remind us nothing is exact when it comes to politics, right? Dealing with life and loss and struggle and human people who do amazing things and sometimes storm the capital. This is not an exact science. It's an esprit de finesse. It's a sense of things, right? So I want to hear these stories. I want to get inside their worlds. And based on the stereotype, based on what a lot of you think, you're expecting that I went in there and what I heard was a lot of diatribes about how secular citizens are immoral baby killers who get divorced every 15 minutes, <laughs> right? That's what people thought I was going to hear, and that's the question I get. But that's, I didn't hear anything like that. So if you have a stereotype of this subculture, I'm here to tell you it's wrong. Right? There is good reason to believe that what you see in the media is not right. Most of the stories I heard said that overt, radical, rage-filled, Political agitation harmed the public witness of people who believe in Jesus and that people shouldn't do it. 
I heard that. That was said more times than anything else, hands down. People who give sermons about democracy, about economic stewardship, about taxes, they talk about American democracy as precious, as a gift from the nation's founder to all citizens and as something that should be cherished. They talk about it as something that citizens should participate in. They tell them that voting matters. This is something our churches are doing better than really any other subculture I'm familiar with in terms of a subculture that's not overtly meant to do politics. This was a really good thing that I heard. But those same pastors also believe that God is transcendent and heaven is real. And they believe that the purpose of life is to become saved and go to heaven. And there is the, stere the stereotype of Christians in the public sphere is that they're obsessed with sin and they want to pass laws to create a nation where everyone has to live in particular kinds of ways according to particular kinds of rules. And the truth is they would prefer, oh, they being the rough, I'm not saying everybody, they would prefer this to be the case. They, they don't, it's not that they don't like candidates who like this. Okay? They just don't think it's their main job to politic for that all the time. Okay? Because really they talk about culture as, as, as a wasteland that can't be saved, not the culture. And so, and this is where it becomes problematic. I'm not here to just tell you. I'm not here to just tell you don't worry about it. They tell people to vote, but then they say, look to God, look to heaven, look there for hope, because your primary, your primary citizenship is in heaven. And I think of this as a kind of active indifference or an engaged indifference. You should be active, you should vote, don't stay home, but then you have permission to disengage and be indifferent. You get to offload your responsibility onto God. And so pastors and in Bible studies, what I heard were, were stories that framed God as responsible. God is responsible for the nation's democratic future. Rather than self-governing citizens as responsible for the nation's democratic future. So how, what did that sound like? Well, here's some quotes. I'm not, this is pastors talking, not Sam Owens. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to tell you to vote. Accurate. We have the luxury of living in a democratic society where we can say what we believe in a ballot box. So we should, we should vote. We should voice our concern in the public discourse, active. We are very fortunate to live in a country where we have a vote. We have our problems, but at least we have a say and we can go to the poll and we can vote. And I hope that you will do that, active. But we need to remember that the system we live in is broken. Culture is culture's not your mission field. Saving the system's not your mission field. That's the active. Here's the indifference. It's dangerous. Even though you live here, remember you don't belong here. Remember you march to the beat of a different drummer. Even though you live here physically, you are part of a supernatural otherworldly kingdom. So live that way. We don't really belong here. Our image comes from another place. That means our identity, our hope, our faith, our loyalties live within a different kingdom than the kingdom called Earth. Listen, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. God rules the universe with his feet up. Isn't that good? He's not stressed. He just goes, next. This is easy stuff. I got this covered. And you should never come to a place where you are hopeless or where you despair. God that causes things to happen. God overrules with what men rule. And finally, God is not freaking out about the election. He's not up in heaven going, oh, dear Lord, oh, dear me. He's not freaking out. So I'm not freaking out. I know exactly what November 9th holds. It holds another day in God's perfect sovereignty over the universe. God is still in control. We don't need to fret or worry. Now, if you don't happen to be an evangelical Christian, I want you to hear this next part because it couldn't be more important. If you don't hear anything else, else I say, I want you to hear this. From a theological standpoint, from an evangelical standpoint, these words make perfect sense. 
a lot of times people tell me, they try to argue with me. These, this is, these words are totally legitimate words. These words make perfect sense. The faith makes sense. Many times outsiders to evangelicalism, especially when it comes to their moment in politics, try to suggest to me that their beliefs are illegitimate. But that's not true and it's not fair. When it comes to born again Christianity, you either believe in Jesus or you don't. You either believe in a life hereafter or you don't. And if you don't, then you probably don't call yourself an evangelical Christian. But if you do, you probably believe there is a God who is ultimately in control of your life and the universe writ large. You probably believe that. And telling people that they shouldn't believe that is just, it's just wrong in a zillion different directions. But I'm not arguing that this storytelling inside churches about politics and the nation's, uh, the nation's economic system, I'm not arguing that it's no problem. Because it is open to critique. And it is causing real harm because of the things the pastors leave out. Because for devout, born-again born Christians, these folks think God's hand is in everything. And remember in Plotment, they're telling a story not just about God, but about the nation. And they're telling a story about our national politics and our local politics that has God as a central character. Where God is solving everything, every event is related, every event can be explained, and every event has cosmically significant meaning. And so via active indifference, there's this idea that people can participate in democracy, but then not have to worry about what happens happens next. Because no matter what happens, God is already and will always be in control. So whether we're thinking about global pandemics where people are dying or economic downturns that are costing people their jobs and homes or campaigns with candidates proposing to do harm to vulnerable constituencies, evangelicals are telling a story in a really important culture, subculture, that is promising constantly nothing really bad is happening. Because there's never an option available but for God to have a plan that he will see through to completion. And that is the story if you would talk about politics and religion, you can interrupt. Because bad stuff is happening. And you can affirm that in the end it will be okay while pointing out right now it's not okay. You can affirm both if you will talk about the stories. Because believers, by telling them a story over and over again, they get to both be on God's side in the election and also divest themselves of any responsibility for what happens. They get to have their cake and eat it too. And this divestiture of interest is a violation of the American social contract. It tears asunder the true call to citizenship. Because among the foundational assumptions at work in political theory, the foundational assumptions of the people who founded the nation is that people want control of their lives. We want agency, we want to be free. And when we vote, we're acting out this agency. We're becoming a self-determining people. And the self-determination is, is the democracy's highest goal. Those are our political rights of speech, religion, association, representation. These are the things that reinforce our political agency. These are endowments that assure us we are equal in the eyes of the state and that the state responds to the will of the people, Shiva, not the people responding to the will of the state. Active indifference obfuscates all of this. Because when pastors told their audiences to vote but not worry because God is in control, they encourage their, they encourage their congregants to cede not only responsibility but also agency. They passed off to God their civic responsibility. And to this critique, conservative evangelicals might reply that for them and their fellow believers, their voices and their votes is not their primary value. Their gift to their community and God is to deny their agency out of submission to the one who holds the universe in their hand. Maybe. But the one who holds the universe in his hands is unseen. As citizens, we have an obligation to appear. As Hannah Arendt once told us, the capacity to appear, to be present in the public sphere, is the essence of true citizenship. We owe it to each other. So I want to ask you what your story is. What does being a city on a hill mean to you? 
And what are the ways you deny responsibility for what's happening in the nation? Because you probably need to be challenged about that too. My point here today, despite the passion in my voice, because I've listened to a lot of pastors, <laughs> my point here today is not to say that the polarization and the storming of the Capitol and everything that's happening lies at the feet of the evangelical subculture. That is not my point. That just happens to be how I study understanding stories. My point is to say that if you really listen, as I have done to a group of people who I wanted to understand better, if you really listen, you might hear things that surprise you and that cause you to learn. It's harder to hate people up close. And it's easier to ask questions that might get you to work. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we have, so our next, the breakout sessions start at 1.15. Um, the high, so we go back to the place we just were. I can't remember the name of it. I'm new to Boise State. Um, and if you're if you're uh, if you're calling it a day because you've learned more than your brain can take, thank you so much. Please please send us an email. Let you know. Let, you know you can um, send us an email. Send an email to the Frank.